The Subjection of Women by John Stuart Mill. Um, you have the entirety of On Liberty included in Khan, but only the first chapter of four of subject, uh, Subjection of Women, um, mainly because uh, most of the philosophical argumentation and, and the interesting ideas from a philosophical point of view are contained in this first chapter. The, remain, the remaining chapters are more political and more sort of um, tied to the time and place that Mill wrote it, which is England of the latter half of the 19th century. Um, Mill was always uh, at least a proto-feminist. Uh, as he says, uh, the first sentence of the subjection of women is the object of this essay is to explain as clearly as I'm able the grounds of an opinion which I've held from the very earliest period which I had formed when I had formed any opinions at all on social or political matters uh, for example he was arrested as a young man distributing literature on contraception arguing that contraception should be widely available because um, Otherwise, women are sort of tied to child rearing and child bearing. Uh, also, uh, Mill is well, as is well known, uh, the love of his life was Harriet Taylor, uh, whom he regarded as a uh, an intellectual equal. He said that many of the good ideas in On Liberty should be attributed to her. Um, and uh, this was unusual at the time. It probably still is unusual for him to say, be so effusive about the intellectual contributions of a woman to his writings. Um, she had died by the time Subjection of Women was written, um, probably leading, leaving him heartbroken. He, he loved her for a very long time, but they couldn't get married because she was married to somebody else and they had to wait for him to die which he did, leaving them about 10 years of married life. Um, but, uh, yeah, Mill was unusual, certainly for the time, for how pro-women uh, pro he was in particular, uh, he, uh, how praising he was of intellectual contributions uh, and the intellectual power of Harriet Taylor in particular, and you'll see other women in the course of this writing. Uh, it also ties in with some of the themes that we see in On Liberty. Uh, it is regarded as one of the earliest and probably clearest liberal feminist works. Um, this is as opposed to, say, socialist or communist feminist works. Um, because it's liberal in the sense that Mill retains his faith in the free marketplace. As we saw in On Liberty, he, he regarded uh, freedom of expression as uh, partly justified by a marketplace of ideas. Uh, letting everybody act freely will lead to the betterment of the entire species. And he thinks uh, the same thing of uh, women. Although, he does give interesting arguments that uh, a Marxist feminist might be able to use, particularly about the shaping of women's characters by uh, unjust social institutions. Okay, uh, so what is it that he's arguing for? Again, for the, from the first page in your book, that the principle which regulates the existing social relations between the two sexes the legal subordination of one sex to the other is wrong in itself and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement again this is a uh, carries on the theme from on liberty that mill is very much concerned with man as a progressive being humankind as a progressive being that we can improve ourselves which is i think a rousseauian theme as well uh, and that we should always be striving to better ourselves. And he says that uh, the inequality of the sexes or the subordination of women is a hindrance to this. Think how much better off we would all be if women were allowed 
the freedom uh, that men have had. Uh, what geniuses, uh, what women geniuses have been suppressed by these kinds of uh, corrupt institutions. Uh, now one of the chief hindrances of human improvement and that it ought to be replaced by a principle of perfect equality, admitting no power or privilege on the one side nor disability on the other. Again, this is pretty radical stuff for when Mill is writing. It's before women have the vote, although, as he mentions, there are certainly movements afoot um, to gain women the vote, but they, they don't have the vote. They're not allowed to be representatives in government. Now, he does point out that, of course, England had a queen at the time, one of uh, the two great queens in England's probably greatest rulers in its history are um, certainly in its, you know, after the time, after the Middle Ages or, uh, or something or anything like that, are probably Queen Elizabeth I, who was, of course, queen in Shakespeare's time in the um, 1500s, and uh, Queen Victoria, who presided over first of all, ruled for the longest time until the current queen, Queen Elizabeth II, who just seems like she'll never die, um, but also presided over the British Empire, which was the biggest empire, I think, that the world has ever seen. Um, so, you know, Brit the Brits have no problem with being ruled by a queen. Uh, and Mill points this out. Uh, he uses this as an argument against the idea that um, uh, that the subordination of women is natural in some sense, as we'll see. Okay, so he's going to argue for equality of the sexes. Now, right off the bat, he knows that people are going to laugh at him. Um, they are going to... Uh, there was a... I can't remember when... I think probably uh, contemporary to Mill, there was a pamphlet circulated that um, parodied calls for women's liberation by comparing them with calls for animals to be given the same rights as, uh, as humans, which is rather in the same way that opponents to, of gay marriage says if you say if you legalize gay marriage you'll have to legalize bestiality it's always a tactic of the obnoxious uh, and conservative to try to denigrate calls for equality by comparing them with calls for equality of animals you know implying that women are on the level of non-human animals uh, so that's the kind of uh, atmosphere that Mill is writing in, that he knows that uh, a large, probably the majority of people, will laugh him out of court at this suggestion. Um, sadly. Uh, so, he does a lot to uh, sort of clear the gr ground for making his case. Um, and some of it, he... I. Mill has some wonderful turns of phrases, um, as we've already seen in On Liberty, but um, he points out that if he was just giving an argument, if he was just arguing against an argument in favor of uh, the subjection of women, he would have an easier time of it because arguments can be defeated. You can point out the logical problems with them and this is easily done he says with uh, the argument for inequality uh, but sadly he's not arguing against an argument he's arguing against feeling and custom and he says those uh, and he, he says something that actually psychologists ha are making a fuss about uh, right now which is that if you provide evidence against a claim that people believe, not only will it not cause them to stop believing it, it will cause them to believe it even more strongly and to hate you. Which is why, of course, you know, anti-vaxxers can't be easily defeated and um, uh, fanatical 
supporters of a certain president who shall not be named uh, also can never be persuaded of his manifest failings and um, iniquities because they will just shut their minds to you. And, and he says much the same thing. He says, so long as an opinion is uh, strongly rooted in the feelings, it gains rather than loses in stability by having a prepondering, pre preponderating weight of arguments against it. For if it were accepted as a result of argument, the refutation of the argument might shake the solidity of the conviction. But when it rests solely on feeling, the worse it fares in argumentative context, the more persuaded its adherents are that their feelings must have some deeper ground which the arguments do not reach. And while the feeling remains, it is always throwing up fresh entrenchments of arguments to repair any breach made in the old. So he realizes he's got um, a steep hill to climb in persuading uh, male chauvinists or even women who accept the claim that they are unequal. Um, and, you know, they they exist. Uh, I think uh, there, there's a... I saw some woman on Twitter or one of the social media platforms called the, the Transformed Wife or something like that, who argues... who does nothing but argue that her role is to stay home and cook for her husband and produce babies and that's it. So these people are out there using modern technology to this day. Um, and as another great f turn of phrase, he says, the barbarisms to which men cling longest, uh, it, it is assumed that the barbarisms to which men cling longest must be less barbarisms than those which they earlier shake off, which of course he's going to deny. He's going to point out that we've, we've reached the point in the 19th century just about uh, when intelligent people realize that slavery is unjustified and that an absolutist monarchy is unjustified um, but we haven't reached that point with uh, subjection of women is unjustified so people assume because we've still got it it must be in some way better than the other two because we've gotten rid of the other two but we keep this one and he says, well, no, just because we've clung to this barbarism longer doesn't mean it's any better. And he says, the burden of proof, or burthen, as they used to say, uh, burthen, burden of proof should lie on people arguing against it. He says, two principles have emerged in the progression of um, civilization. Uh, that is, the principle that li of liberty... Uh, should be the default position. That is, freedom for all should be the default position, and if you're arguing against freedom, the burden of proof should be on you. And also, impartiality, he says. Uh, any disqualification or disparity of privilege affecting one person or kind of person as compared with others. So, uh, if you're arguing against equality or against impartiality, the burden of proof should be on you. So what this should mean, says Mill, is that if you're arguing for the subjection of women, the burden of proof should be on you. Um, but, he says, it's useless, this is the second column on page 1019, it's useless for me to say that those who maintain the doctrine that men have a right to command and women are under an obligation to obey, or that men are fit for government and women unfit, are on the affirmative side of the question and that they're bound to po show positive... Uh, evidence. In other words, the burden of proof should be on them. But, of course, he realizes this is never going to happen. He's, if he were to say, you know, I've got the default position, so if you're going to argue for keeping the status quo, you have to prove it, he says, nobody's going to buy that. Even though it should be the case, nobody's going to buy that, so I'm going to have to... It, it, it's as if you were in a defense... It's as if there was a system of guilty until proven innocent, he's saying then the lawyer would have to prove innocence. I'm in that position. It's as if I'm arguing for innocence instead of what should be the case, that the uh, prosecution has the burden of proof. Then uh, on 1020, he points out that uh, uh, the 18th century, which is sort of the most philosophically rich century, 
uh, was when reason was um, exalted the most. People, you know, this is the enlightenment. Uh, now there's sort of been a rebound and an opposition to that in the 19th century to say that uh, they overdid it, probably influenced by Rousseau. Rousseau, of course, was the critic of the Enlightenment. Um, and we saw what uh, Mill said, that he was actually less correct than the people he was arguing against. This was in On Liberty, even though it was important for him to challenge those ideas for reasons that uh, are to do with, uh, that he uses to argue for um, freedom of expression in On Liberty. Uh, so Rousseau is one of the first people to say no um, reason is not the be all and end all you know the uh, noble savage knows what's going on uh, and that has sort of led to a backlash in the 19th century where he says uh, we, for the apotheosis of reason of the 18th century we in the 19th century have substituted that of instinct and we call everything instinct, which we find in ourselves and for which we cannot trace any rational foundation. This is a negative development as far as he's concerned, because it means that people don't have to give arguments for things. They, they say, I just, I know instinctively that it, this is right. Of course, I can't give an argument for it because that's what reason does. But I know it in my heart that this is the right way of doing things. Uh, and along with instinct, uh, he says, is culture. Uh, and Culture and custom. That is custom. So uh, what people who favor instinct can say is that if a practice is customary, there must be something good about it. Why has it lasted this long? Why has it felt so right? to so many generations of humans as people can point to with the inequality of women, that of um, the subjection of women. Now, what Mill says in response to this is, well, this would be an argument for it. Custom would be justified in supporting this practice if the custom resulted from experience of the alternatives. So in other words, uh, you might say, uh, why do, um, I don't know, uh, you, you might look at a carpenter and, and look at the way they construct a door and say, well, why do you do it that way? And the answer is probably going to be because of a course of trial and error of carpenters through the years, this has turned out to be the best system. And that's why carpenters today make doors that way, because they made them wrong in the past, and then somebody made it this way and realized, oh, this is so much better. Mill says, if that was the case with the practice of uh, men being in charge and women having no say and having to do what men say, if, we've, if we tried every alternative and this turned out to be the best one, then yes, custom would be a good, it would be good to appeal to custom, just as uh, appealing to custom amongst carpenters would justify a particular way of making a door. But he says, we've never done that. It's not the case that we've done, we've looked at all these different systems, some matriarchies where women are in charge, some absolute equality, and some patriarchies, and it turned out the patriarchies just were so much more successful and better, and everybody lived better as a result. That didn't happen. He says, um, this is second column on page 120, about two-thirds down. In the first place, the opinion in favor of the present system, which entirely subordinates the weaker sex to the stronger, uh, awkward use of terms there, um, rests upon theory only, <coughs> for there never has been <coughs> a trial made of any other. So that experience, in the sense in which it is vulgarly opposed to theory, cannot be pretended to have pronounced any verdict. Uh, experience can only favor a system <coughs> when it can be compared with the others. But we've never tried the others, so you can't say that. And in the second place, the adoption of this system of inequality never was the result of deliberation or forethought. So it's not as if people said, hmm, how should we organize society? 
there are there are many ways we could do it I know let's do it this way uh, he said that never happened uh, he suggests that in fact the way it arose is that men just happened to be stronger than women and so they got to push them around and said we will hurt you if you don't let us boss you around uh, so this is as he says the law of the strongest or might makes right now this is a principle that even in Mill's time was rejected. I mean, we've, it, it, it wasn't accepted by any of the writers that we've looked at, the great uh, political theorists. So of course it isn't objected, <coughs> it isn't um, accepted by the 19th century. Uh, <coughs> but what is happening, says Mill, is that people don't realize that that's the only principle on which this idea that women should um, should be ruled by men rests. They think it's got uh, a more sophisticated justification, but no, says Mill, that's all there is. This principle that we have rejected in all other regards, we've rejected it as a justification for slavery. Uh, <clears throat> but for some reason we haven't noticed that it, it, uh, it is the basis for this custom that we still accept. So top of the second column uh, on page 1021. Um, we now live, that is to say one or two of the most advanced nations of the world now live, in a state in which the law of the strongest seems to be entirely abandoned as the regulating principle of the world's affairs. Nobody professes it. And yet... Um, it is still in force uh, as a um, as justifying the inequality of women. Then he goes into a discussion of sort of the history of the at changing attitude to slavery and the power of the church to. Uh, he said that. Everybody understands that there's no justification for slavery except the rule of the strongest. That is the, the only way that people could even attempt to justify slavery uh, in the modern age is because we can do it. We get to enslave you because we've got bigger guns than you and we can, we can do it. And of course that is no moral justification. So that's why, uh, you know, even in uh, even in America, slavery was regarded as immoral by this point. Um, but what he points out is that the law of the strongest is remarkably tenacious, even in even as regards slavery. And he, uh, on page one hundred twenty-two, he says uh, the church had enormous power and influence over um, kings and uh, the common people the bottom of the second column it said it, it could make thousands in the prime of life and in the height of worldly advantages shut themselves up in convents or give give their lives in crusades it could make re kings relinquish their wives because it said oh i'm sorry by our calculation um that you're too close related to the wife that you love so you can't marry her and kings would do what the church said but except in one respect he said bottom of 10222, top of 1023, it could not make them renounce either of the applications of force, force militant or force triumphant. It's only, the only time when the strongest relinquish power is when the weak get a little bit of power of their own. So the only time that uh, kings gave up some of their power was when a wealthy and warlike bourgeoisie in the fortified towns developed and uh, acquired their own armed forces. Um, so that's the only way that progress is made, not through enlightenment. The, uh, we think that we gave up the right of the strongest through enlightenment. Oh no, it only happened because the weak acquired some power. Uh, and he gives, so having talked about slavery as the example in the second column on 1023, um, he talks about absolute monarchy. So these are the two things that he compares 
as unjust systems that we reject, we in the 19th century reject. And he's saying, but look, they're just like this subjection of women. And he says, in fact, on 1023 and 1024, women are worse off <coughs> than the slaves and the subjects of absolutist monarchs because, number one, um, in the case of the other two, it was the minority who held power. In the case of absolute monarch, just one person. Whereas in the case of the subjection of women, it's 50% of the population who hold the power. Uh, whatever, bottom of page 1023, whatever gratification of pride there is in the possession of power and whatever personal interest in its exercise is in this case not confined to a limited class but common to the whole male sex. So it's much less likely that they're going to give it up. Uh, on page 1024, the clodhopper exercises or is to exercise his share of the power equally with the hi highest nobleman. I don't know what a clodhopper is, but presumably it might be a sod farmer, um, but it doesn't sound like a, and certainly it isn't used now as a, uh, as a compliment. Um, someone low on the totem pole, basically. The lowest man on the totem pole still has his share of power, and he will cling to it, because um, when you've got very little power, the power that you do have is oh so precious to you. Um, it's also true that the possessors of the power have facilities in this case greater than, greater than any other to prevent any uprising against it. Um, every one of the subjects, every woman that is, lives under the very eye and almost it may be said in the hands of one of the masters. In closer intimacy with him than with any of her fellow subjects, with no means of combining against him. So how was it that uh, the power of the strongest was overturned in these other two cases, slavery and absolutist monarchy? Answer, um, the, uh, the people who were affected rose up against the masters. And they were only able to do that because they could mobilize, because they had they were out of the watchful eye and they could gather together and form a group and have an uprising, like a slave revolt, which happened in several cases, for example, on Haiti. Um, but that can't happen with women because it's as if each one of the women is assigned her own jailer who will not let her combine with the other women. Um, because they're paired off with uh, the person who has power over them, their husbands. Um, in struggles for political emancipation, everybody knows how often its champions are bought off by bribes or daunted by terrors. In other words, what happens is uh, you get the leader of a slave revolt and the people in power uh, bribe the leader of the slave revolt. Come, come with us, you know, join us. You don't need to be with these slaves, you know, we like you, you can be one of the ruling class. And suddenly they lose all their um, interest in a revolt. Um, in the case of women, each individual of the subject class is in a chronic strait of bribery and intimidation combined. Uh, they are made to love their captors, so they don't want to revolt against them. And um, also, you know, they know that he can abuse them with impunity if they do object. The law would always side with um, with a man. Have you ever heard of the rule of thumb? People talk about the rule of thumb. Look up the origin of that term. In fact, the rule of thumb relates to you are allowed to beat your wife with a stick as thick as your thumb. If he goes thicker than that, Oh, you're not allowed to do that. But as long as it's no thicker than your thumb, you're allowed to thrash your wife with that stick. That's the kind of thing that Mill is up against. Well, arguing against, it's the women who are up against it. Okay, so Mill has argued then, uh, thus far, for a close analogy with the subjection of women with other forms of uh, subjection that he knows are widely rejected. And he says, if you're against those, as everybody is, you should be against this too. 
now he considers objections. And the first objection on the second column of page 1024 is, but it's different. He says, some will object that a comparison cannot fairly be made between the government of the male sex and the forms of unjust power which I have adduced in illustration of it. Since these, slavery, uh, absolutist monarchy, are arbitrary and the effect of mere usurpation, while it, that is the subjection of women, on the country is natural. So the argument is, this is different from those others because it's a natural state of affairs. It's natural that women should be ruled by men. Uh, his response to this is, well, people always say uh, the subjection they favor is natural. Look at Aristotle. He says, Aristotle, a godlike genius in many respects, but he justified slavery. This is a huge blot on the work of Aristotle, as which we, we saw at the beginning of the semester, that he justifies slavery. And, you know, people say, Aristotle's a smart guy, but yeesh, you know. Um, and actually, this is true of a lot of the great philosophers. Kant and even, I, I regret to say, the mighty Hume have blind spots when it comes to racism, both of them say the most appallingly racist things and you think how can they who are so enlightened in other respects have this blind spot people have blind spots in areas where custom backs them up of course they had slaves in aristotle's time um so why you know it, it's understandable that he should justify it or see that it's okay one of the points that counts in Plato's favor, uh, Plato is mentioned on the opposite page, top of second column on 1025 in this respect. In the Republic, Plato argues for equality for women um, in a way that is profoundly shocking, certainly was for profoundly shocking to readers of the modern age. Um, he argues that women should be warriors in the Republic. In fact, this was so shocking that a popular interpretation of the Republic uh, by a guy called Alan Bloom argued that he can't really have meant it, that it must have been some hidden message, that that, that, that was like the key clue he was saying, don't take this literally because I'm kidding. And it, it's obvious that I'm kidding because only somebody who was kidding would suggest this. Um, I don't think that's right. I think he was legitimately suggesting this. And certainly uh, Plato's teacher Socrates said that his teacher uh, was a woman. Uh, and so Plato had, uh, as an example, someone who revered as an intellectual equal a woman, which would be equally shocking as being a woman warrior at the time. All right. So. Uh, back to Aristotle. Arist even the great Aristotle says uh, Mill justified slavery. We know that he was wrong, um, but this is an illustration of the temptation to think that the inequalities that favor us are natural, because Ar that's how Aristotle does defend slavery. He says some people are born to rule and some people are born to be ruled. It is just natural. And he says, well, that's bullshit. Uh, he says, at the time they argued the Greeks were of a free nature, the barbarian races of Thracians and Asiatics of a slave nature. That's just blatant Greece favoring. Um, and we know it now. We can see that he was wrong to say that. People of the future will say the same about us, he says. The theorists of absolutist monarchy have always affirmed it to be the only natural form of government, as we saw with John Filmer, whom... Uh, Robert Filmer, I always say John Filmer, Robert Filmer, whom John Locke was arguing against, said the divine right of kings, that it's natural that certain people should rule. Bottom of 1024, conquering races hold it to be nature's own dictate that the conquered should obey the conquerors. So in other words, what Mill says is, everybody thinks that what they like is natural, but that's no argument. Um... He said, the, uh, and we can tell actually that this is custom and that it's not natural because we can point to cases 
of cultures who didn't think that it was natural that women should be subjected. He said, look at the Amazons. The Greeks had this admittedly mythical idea, but that showed that they didn't think it was ridiculous that women should rule because they had the Amazons, as seen in the documentary Wonder Woman. Um, and also Spartan women. Uh, Spartan women were warriors, uh, tough warriors too. And as he says, play the, what Plato advocates in the Republic. So, sorry that you can't argue that this is natural. All right, second objection. But, this is top of second column on 1025. But, it will be said, the rule of men over women differs from these others in not being a rule of force. It is accepted voluntarily. Women make no complaint and are consenting partners to it. So the first argument, first objection was it's natural. The second uh, objection is it's voluntary. Well, uh, to this he says, obviously not, because look, there are many thousands of women headed by the most eminent women I know have petitioned Parliament for their admission to the parliamentary suffrage. So the suffragette movement was already in full swing at the time. And he says there are movements in the United States, France, Italy, Switzerland, Russia. All of these cases have suffragette movements. So clearly some women are not consenting to this. Um, and he says, and furthermore, no one can possibly know, but there are uh, abundant tokens of how many would cherish um, aspirations to vote were they not so strenuously taught to repress them as contrary to the proprieties of their sex. He says, notice how hard we have to work to convince women as, as little girls that they don't want to vote. We wouldn't have to work this hard if they were freely didn't want to vote. We would just say, do what you want. Oh, you don't want to vote? You want to be married to a man and, and do everything for him? Great. We wouldn't have to force them then, but we force them. Um, mention of my namesake. My dad's a history teacher and he told me that I was named after Simon de Montfort. And there he is. Uh, there is never any want of women who complain of ill usage by their husbands. He says everybody knows that women complain that their husbands treat them badly. And he says, uh, and what Mill is saying, is that this is the first step to arguing against the general rule of men over women. Sure, they're only complaining about their husbands, but as he says, it is a political law of nature that those who are under any power of ancient origin never begin by complaining about the power itself. So they don't start by saying it's wrong that men should be in charge. Um, but only if it's oppressive exercise. They say it's wrong that this guy, my husband, should be bossing me around. But what this is just the first stage of a criticism of the actual process, he says. Uh, then he points out that um, abusers abused women are placed back in the power of their abusers, which doesn't happen to anybody else but children. Um, and he says, oh, uh, halfway down the first column on 1026, all causes social and natural combine to make it unlikely that women should be collectively rebellious, like they, they can't combine. They are so far in a position different from other subject classes because their masters require something more than them than actual service. So unlike slave owners who just want their slaves to work for them, uh, men want their women to love them as well. Men do not want solely the obedience of women, they want their sentiments. All men except the most brutish desire to have in the woman most nearly connected with them, not a forced slave, but a willing one, not a slave merely, but a favorite, in other words, someone who loves them. And they use the whole power of education, the whole force of education to shape women and to convince women that this is what they want. Uh, second column on 1026. When we put together three things. First, the natural uh, attraction between the sexes. So women are naturally attracted to men. That much uh, Mill will concede to nature. That, you know, obviously the species would die out if there wasn't some sexual attraction. So there is a, a, women are sexually attracted to men, obviously. 
he's not considering gay women but give him a chance he's he's handling feminism he'll get to gay rights maybe he would have got to gay rights eventually uh secondly the wife's entire dependence on the husband so she she's sexually attracted to him she is entirely dependent on him um uh, because he's he is her gateway to to any monetary or social gain and lastly the principal object of human consideration on all objects of social ambition can be in general be sought or obtained by her only through him whatever she wants to do in her life um, he has to allow her to do so those three things uh, when you consider that it's no it's no wonder that women are meek and submissive. So, the argument is women consent. He's saying, first of all, there's all these women that don't. Second, even if we look at the women who consent, why are they consenting? They're consenting because this is their only way to get anything, get anywhere in life. And furthermore, even if they say, yes, this is what I want, they've been brainwashed, essentially. Uh, it's as if you said, you know, you saw a, a, a slave who had been beaten until they were submissive and they were saying, this is what I want. Is it really what they would want in ideal situations? Obviously not, says Mel. Can it be doubted that any of the other yokes which mankind have succeeded in breaking, slavery for example, would have subsisted until now if the same means had existed and have been so sedulously used to bow down their minds to it? In other words, Slavery would still exist if uh, we employed on slaves the same tactics that men employ on women. You could brainwash them so that they consented to it. Um, okay, so that uh, he's responded to the argument that it's natural and to the argument that it is um, consensual. Now, on page 127, he says, he points again at the stage we've reached, reached in the development of the human race. For what is the peculiar character of the modern world, the difference which chiefly distinguished modern institutions, modern social ideas, modern life itself from those of the times long past, implying that this is good, we've progressed, this is a good thing. What is it that makes us good? It is that human beings are no longer born to their place in life and chained down by an inexorable bond. Uh, in other words, it's the freedom. This is a liberal idea, the idea that people should be free. You're not a slave to um, genetics or, you know, or, or you're not in a hierarchical society where if you're born the child of a poor person, that's where you will stay and there's no social advancement. He says, the, what's good about the modern world is wherever you're born, you can advance. There are no legal barriers and there shouldn't be uh, monetary values, barriers. Again, Mill is a liberal in the sense that libertarians like, that he says you should be free to do that. But like Bernie Sanders, he appreciates that um, liberty is not worth anything without... Uh, a good education which should be provided by the state and um, you know uh, health care and things like that so he would have a very a very strong social safety net but back to the issue at hand he says um, so we've got rid of the idea that if you're born black you have to be a slave well let's get rid of the idea that if you're born a woman you sh should be born a slave I mean you, you should remain a slave um, he says in the free market essentially nobody thinks it, this is the last few lines on page 1027 no one thinks it necessary to make a law that only a strong armed man shall be a blacksmith freedom in competition suffice to make blacksmiths strong armed men because the weak armed men can earn more by engaging in occupations for which they are more fit this is uh, Mill's love of the free market this is where libertarians would agree with him he says, once you let freedom reign, uh, then you can say where people congregate is where they've chosen to be and what is better suit to, suited to you. The trouble with subjection of women is it's not the free market. You are brainwashing people. You are forcing people. It is 
uh, it is anathema to freedom and the free market. Now, modern, certainly Marxist feminists, would not have this kind of um, sympathy for the free market. They would say that there are other things, that the idea of the free market is inherently ideological, that it leads to inequalities and can in reinforce inequalities too. Um, but they can say that with kind of the benefit of hindsight because women have achieved some freedoms that were only that Mill was only dreaming of, that women in Mill's times only dreamed of. So, you know, think of Mill as arguing for a good first step. Removing legal barriers. Once you remove legal barriers, well, actually, Mill is also saying removing social and cultural barriers too. Uh, but, you know, his fondness for the free market is not shared by contemporary um, cultural critics. Um, let's see. Um, where does the mention of the Queen? Yeah, I. Um, what? Uh, Somewhere he says, "What is most um, amazing to uh, visit?" To Yo, the, I missed. I skipped over that. That was in the natural. I wanted to mention this. So back on page one hundred twenty-five, when we're arguing, he's arguing against the idea that the subjection of women is natural, because people say uh, it's always been the case. Women have been married to men. Men, you know, this is the idea essentially that women are uh, gatherers and men are the hunters. That women should stay home and cook, and men are designed because they're bigger and stronger. They should go out. They should do the hunting, bring the food back, and women should stay in the kitchen cooking what the men bring back. It's just natural. And he says. So, so in other words, men should be in charge. Men should make the decisions. They've got bigger brains. They're not as emotional as women. That kind of argument. He's saying, well, but notice we don't believe that about royalty. We have a queen. He says, uh, nothing so much astonishes the people of distant parts of the world when they first learn anything about England as to be told that it is under a queen. So he says, yeah, those people on the other side of the world they think that that's unnatural. Doesn't seem unnatural to us, does it? Because, of course, there is no such thing as natural. Everything we think is natural is just custom. And we happen to have acquired the custom whereby uh, a queen, a woman can be, become the ruler. And when she becomes the ruler, it turns out she's really good at it. Our best rulers, uh, actually an earlier ruler was Bodicea or Boudicca, who gave the Romans everything they could handle. There's a statue to her in London. She's famous for riding against Romans in a chariot with swords on the wheels that slice them to ribbons. Um, so she's sort of a warrior ruler. So we have this tradition in England of being okay with female rulers. And he says, is that natural? No, everything is just based on culture. It's not. There is no such thing as nature. Um, the theme comes up again uh, where he says on pay, back to page 129 uh, first new paragraph the social subordination of women that thus sends out an isolated fact in modern social institutions a solitary breach of what has become the fundamental law the fundamental law means freedom uh, everybody should be free uh, and they shouldn't be dominated by facts about their genetics um, or their social status. Um, he says, this is as odd. This vestige of inequality, it stands out and is as odd as if we had a vast temple of Jupiter Olympus occupied the site of St. Paul's. St. Paul's Cathedral is the famous domed cathedral in London. It's a landmark of London. Imagine if instead of that we had a, a temple to the Roman gods. That would be ridiculous because the Roman gods are long forgotten and rejected. 
Uh, and he says, well, this is just as anachronistic to have this vestige of inequality surrounded by all the equality that we otherwise have. Um, he's, now he considers a couple more, he, he recaps objections. So near the bottom of the first column on 1029, it will not do, for instance, to a certain general terms that the experience of mankind is pronounced in favor of the existing system. We already tackled that. He said we've only had experience of the one. We haven't had experience of both. So you can't say experience justifies this. Or second objection, or if it be said that the adoption of the equality of sexes rests only on theory, that is, you know, uh, that people should be equal, that men and women should be equal is just a theory. He says, well, the alternative is just a theory because you've never tried, you never compared it with anything else. You can't say that uh, men ruling women should be the way it is done because it's better. You can't say it's better because you've never compared it to anything. There's been no control group. Neither does it avail, this is the halfway down the second column on 1029, Neither does it avail anything to say that the nature of the two sexes adapts them to the present functions. So he's recapping the arguments against the nature because he says, and this is a very important point that echoes actually Machiavelli and Rousseau, what is now called the nature of women is an eminently artificial thing. So think of uh, the, what he's talking about is the gender role. Women being sort of more emotional, uh, weaker physically, uh, not interested in math, interested in pretty colors, liking lipstick, all of those things, that's, people say, well, that's just natural. That comes from estrogen or lack of testosterone or something. It leads to these kind of things. He says, bullshit, it's artificial. He says, what is called the nature of women is eminently artificial. The result of forced repression in some directions Forced repression in some directions, like you are prevented from entering government, you're prevented from taking math classes, uh, unnatural stimulation in others. In other words, women are pushed into certain directions. Here, be interested in dresses. Be interested in, we will, the only education we'll give you is in how to make yourself look pretty. And he compares this uh, with a tree that is kept in a, uh, vapor bath, in other words, that is a naturally um, accelerated growth, and the other half in the snow, in other words, repressed. So this is like the repression and the encouragement. You're encouraged in one direction and repressed in another. He compares, this is on 1030 for his column, it's like a tree, and I suppose you point it to this tree and say, this is how trees are supposed to be, they're natural. No, it's unnatural. The tree that you results is unnatural. Uh, and the the woman, uh, if you point to, you know, women as they're supposed to be in 19th century England, I mean, this includes things, even their physical shape is unnatural because they've been forced to wear corsets and things like that. Um, and he says, look, people have said certain people are naturally one way or another throughout the centuries, and we didn't believe them. Um, and you always point you can always point to particular instances and say look oh look a drunken irishman isn't that just like irishman no he's a drunk who happens to be irish because a cottier deeply in arrears to his landlord is not industrious there are people who think that the irish are naturally idle uh because constitutions can be overthrown when the authorities appointed to them execute them turn their arms against them there are people who say that the french incapable of free government. This is like a reference to the French Revolution, talking about the Turks and so on. All of these stereotypes uh, are also appeal to the idea of nature. Now, um, how would we find... Uh, so he imagines a critic saying, well, all right, what is the nature of women? He says, well, you need to ask them. First of all, you need to ask them, and you haven't. There are... Um, Certainly women are starting to write things, talking about their own experiences, but they don't get them published if they say the wrong things. Uh, I, uh, one of the great novelists of the 19th century who did express what it was like to be a woman um, 
and offer insightful criticisms of marriage relations is published under the name of George Eliot because the only way she could get published is if people thought she was a man. Um, I apparently, this is true, everyone I know who's read it says that Middlemarch is one of the greatest novels ever written and it's written by uh, George Eliot who was uh, I think a socialist or at least sympathetical to socialists. So, you know, I, we, uh, we haven't allowed women to talk. Uh, the p women, the female writer he re refers to is Madame de Stael, who wrote Delphine, and was um, she was one of the first critics of Napoleon. After the French Revolution, she spotted Napoleon getting ideas of being an emperor and tried to, you know, point this out to people. And as a result, when Napoleon came to power, he t chased her out of France. But she, she kept a sort of uh, intelligentsia circle advocating against Napoleon for her entire life but that's an example of uh, Delphine is a is a, a a work of social criticism and he says there's more like that a lot more if we allowed if we listen to women but having said that he says uh, you know, oh men think they know women why do they think they know women because they're married to them but First of all, uh, so for one thing, they only know their wives. They don't know any other women because other women don't talk to them and other women aren't allowed to publish. But they don't really know their wives. Even if their wife loves them, their wife is, going, is not going to be honest with them, even if she thinks she is being honest with them. And he compares the relationship at the top of page 1031 even with true affection, authority on the one side and subordination on the other prevent perfect uh, confidence. That is, a wife is not likely to be honest, even if she wants to be, because of her unequal relationship. Uh, though nothing may be intentionally withheld, much is not shown. In the analogous relation of parent and child, the corresponding phenomenon must have been the observation of everyone, as between father and son, how many other cases in which the father, in spite of real affection on both sides, obviously, obviously to all the world, does not know nor suspect parts of the son's character familiar to his companions and equals. I think of, uh, think of a, a teenage boy who, who works out he's gay. If he loves his father, he's still unlikely to reveal that he's gay to his father because he thinks his father won't like to hear it. Uh, he thinks that his father will stop loving him if he if, if he says that. This is analogous to the situation of a woman, and and also. Um, so in other words, the women, even if they, even if they reject the relationship, are not going to li likely to be tell the the husband because they think it'll make the husband sad, and they've been trained not to want to make their husband sad. Um, and, oh yes, and he says, look, if you really believed that this was natural, then you wouldn't behave the way you do. Because everything in society is geared to force women into these roles. And if they came naturally to women, you wouldn't need to force them. Um, it's like, you know, if <laughs> there's a... Um, I don't know if people still read these, but uh, in the 80s, there was a series of books under the title The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And the second of these was called The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, which was this restaurant that you went to and it had the best meals possible. And one of the meals in The Restaurant at the End of the Universe um, is a cow that they bring out to you and it can talk, it's sentient, and it wants to be eaten. Um, and it tells you, you know, this is the best part of me. This is particularly juicy. And it want, it, its whole purpose in life is to be eaten by you. And it will be grossly offended if you order the salad instead of eating it. If cows were like that, then we wouldn't need to force them into the abattoir as we do. Uh, everything would just be voluntary. We would let them come to us. If women naturally wanted 
to be ruled by men, then why are we forcing them into a particular form of education? We're not saying, would you like to learn math? Would you like to wear pants? Would you like to vote? We're not saying that. We're saying you won't vote. You will not take math classes. You will be interested in pretty ribbons and makeup. Um, and I like the way Mill puts it in his 19th century way. One thing we may be certain of, that what is contrary to women's nature to do, they never will be made to do by simply giving their nature free play. So in other words, if you're worried that, uh, you know, by giving them equality, it will be unnatural. We'll be, we'll be doing them a disservice if we give them equality, say uh, Mill's critics. He, he's saying, well, if it's contrary to their nature, they, allowing them freedom, they won't do it. The anxiety of mankind to interfere on behalf of nature, for fear lest nature should not succeed in effecting its purpose, is an altogether unnecessary solicitude. Um, and he compares, he says, look, this is, this is what is the unstated principle. Uh, and people won't say it because it's giving the game away. This is first new column on page 1033. I should like to hear someone openly enunciating the doctrine. It is already implied in much that is written on the subject. Here's the doctrine. It is necessary to society that women should marry and produce children. They will not do so unless they are compelled. Therefore, it is necessary to compel them. Sounds like something that uh, men's rights groups or red pillars would actually say on message boards these days. But uh, Mill says nobody actually admits that's what they really that's what they're really saying. That's what culture is really saying. But he says no, nobody says, oh no no we're not saying that. Uh, he's saying you know be honest say what you really mean. And he compares it because this is exactly what the slaveholders of Carolina said. Carolina South Carolina and Louisiana. They used to say this until we called them on their bullshit. He said they used to say it is necessary that cotton and sugar should be grown. White men cannot produce them. Negroes will not for any wage which we choose to give. Ergo, they must be compelled. And of course that stopped when we said, well, try paying them. You can't just compel them. That's wrong. You have to try paying them. And he said uh, an illustration still close to the point is that of impressment. Again, this is... Um, the same phenomenon that Hume mentions in his criticism of the idea that people consent uh, to live where they do. So impressment is called press ganging. It's where uh, sailors recruit other sailors by getting them drunk and then dragging them on ships and then sailing out. And by the time they've sobered up, they're stuck and they say, oh, you freely consented to be in the Navy. Good for you. Um, he said, sailors must absolutely be had to defend the country. It often happens that they will not voluntarily enlist. Therefore, there must be the power of forcing them. We don't accept that anymore. We don't accept uh, forced enslavement anymore. Why is it that we accept um, uh, the subjection of women? It is not a sign of one's thinking the boon one offers very attractive when one allows only Hobson's choice, that or none. In other words, be married to a man and under his subjection or a social pariah because unmarried women couldn't do anything except maybe be a, a governess or, you know, tutor somebody, a rich person's children. That was it. They couldn't do any other job. So if you want to have a life, you have to have this one or basically social out, be a social outcast. That's not a choice. So you can't say because they choose to be a wife that they've actually voluntarily chosen it. Because that's, again, that's like Hume saying you've chosen to become a sailor. Um, there you go. I think that covers the main points of subjection of women.